my name is Chris Cilio. I'm a graduate student here at UC Berkeley, uh, advised by Krista and David Patterson. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about the processor I've been working on called the Berkeley Out of Order Machine. Uh, what is Boom? Boom is a superscalar out of order core. It can fetch multiple instructions, execute them out of order, and it's written in Berkeley's Chisel uh, hardware construction language. I'll talk a little bit about that later. It's synthesizable, so it's real. You can put it to ASIC, you can put it on an FPGA. It's parameterizable, so it's not a single core design. It's actually a whole family of, of potential designs that you can explore design space of whole booms. And this is something that we built because uh, we hope to use it as a platform for architecture research because we are researchers. Um, oh, and one more thing. It is open source, so you can now go and download this. You can play with it. You can tape it out yourself. You can uh, make it better, submit pull requests. Uh, I'm really interested to see what you guys uh, do with this. Um, and it's still a work in progress, uh, so the results are uh, preliminary. Um, at Berkeley, we've open sourced quite a few RISC-V cores. Uh, to start with is our SODOR collection. These are educational, not really synthesizable, uh, kind of uh, fun to play with. Uh, they're designed to introduce you to RISC-V and to introduce the chisel, and we use this uh, for teaching our undergrads. Uh, the big thing is, is the rocket chip SOC generator. So this is an entire SOC. We're talking cores, caches, cache coherence, accelerators, um, a whole lot of fun stuff. And there's multiple cores that you can actually choose to play with rocket chips. So at the small end, there's Z-Scale, named after the very tiniest train there. As a microcontroller, there's also Rocket, our in-order application core, and then what I'm talking about today is our superscalar out-of-order core. Okay, so why out-of-order? It seems like a lot of work. Uh, you have something like a load instruction, right to R2, the subtract actually depends on that, so the subtract can't go until that load comes back. And the problem with the load instructions, they may miss in the cache, you have no idea when they're gonna uh, occur. But the multiply, we don't wanna hold that up, that actually doesn't depend on those, so we can actually execute out of order. So out of order is great for tolerating variable latencies. It's also great for finding instruction level parallelism, even if the programmer didn't know it was there. An out of order superscalar is gonna find it. Uh, and you can also think of this as a really complicated way to give you data uh, prefetching uh, at the word level. And my favorite is it plays nicely with terrible compilers and lazy code. Uh, which is probably most code that's going to run on our processors. Um, now, in terms of downsides, it is complicated, so these are hard to get right. Just look at the errata from Intel or ARM. Uh, and they can be expensive in terms of area or power, although that's a bit misleading, because when you look at the power increase, well, where's the power of your processor going? It's probably the memory system, the pads, the IOs. Um, you don't want a wimpy core that can't really drive that. So an actually, uh, an out-of-order high-performance core can, in fact, give you energy efficiency depending upon your application and, and your environment. So why out-of-order? We care about performance, and they're easy to program. Um, and they utilize the memory system that we give them. Uh, so maybe not a surprise. Uh, these have been pretty widely adopted in industry, all the way up to our servers, all the way down to our cell phones. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, so I figured, hey, if everyone else does it, I should probably build one too. Um, so my goals here as a researcher was, okay, let's build a prototypical out-of-order core. We can provide this as open source, help in education, research, and industry. And we can use this as a baseline for marker architecture research. So if you have an idea for a better issue window or a load store queue, you don't have to build the whole processor and the whole chip around it. You can just pull out Boom and make the change you want. Um, or if you have some other idea that's better than out-of-order, you can use Boom as your control experiment. Um, the other thing is, even if you don't want to actually play around with the microarchitecture, there's a lot of studies that you can do that you want an out-of-order core to really, you know, do a better comparison of maybe memory systems or accelerators. You don't want to try your memory system with an in-order core. You want to try something that industry is using. Uh, and also, there's a lot of methodology research that you can do, maybe exploring design spaces, maybe trying to figure out how do you uh, figure out the power of an application that's long running. These are some things that you can do, and I just give you boom, and you can go off and, and, and play with it. Uh, and then for my case, the last one is I want to use Boom to give me detailed performance, area, and power running real programs. Uh, most research um, uses software simulators, so they can't quite get the, the, the low-level detail that we need. Some of our ideas may only be fighting for a few percent, and that actually is important with Moore's Law starting to end. And also, uh, these simulators are only running at 100 to 1,000 kips, so they only can run segments of programs. They can't really run the full thing. And some researchers are using RTL now, uh, but typically they're really only using RTL to give you kind of a, a guidance on for the area cost of their ideas. Um, so my, my goal is to run Boom uh, and, and get, all this, uh, get all these advantages. Um, now, uh, this is really a team effort. There's a lot of infrastructure that I've been relying on for my lab mates uh, that, they've, that they've made and, and put out there as open source at the Berkeley Architecture Research Group. Uh, we now have a new website and our new mascot, Wafer Bear. Um, I'm going to go into detail of these, uh, 
uh, individual projects, but there's more projects you can learn about at the website. Uh, the first one is RISC-5. Uh, Boom implements the full IMAFD, so it's RV64G plus the privilege spec, virtual memory, so it boots Linux, uh, runs real programs, and there's a few parameters available to you, like whether you want to pipeline the multiplier, or what latency the floating point you want. Um, I'm really glad about RISC-V. It's really easy to implement. Um, this is a great advantage. Uh, a lot of other ISAs that you might choose, you, you really can only implement a subset. Uh, but there's a lot of things available to RISC-V as a relaxed memory model. Uh, this really has a strong effect on the load store unit design. Do loads have to snoop by the loads? If there's a cache coherence thing, does that have to snoop the load store unit? And that can have a real effect on the complexity, uh, the, the new bugs that are exposed, and the, complex, uh, the area in power. Um, it accrues floating point exception flags. So this is nice. I only have to really pay the penalty if the programmer wants to look at the exception flags. Um, there's no integer side effects, no condition codes. Uh, if you want to check for overflow, you just you know, use the branch predictor to, to tell you what's going on, because it, it'll never overflow, usually. Um, so that helps uh, really lower the rename state. Uh, there's no predication or C moves. Uh, that really complicates out-of-order designs. Uh, and no implicit register specifiers, like the jump, you have to specify RD. And the registers stay in the same place, so I can actually do decode and rename in parallel. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, so that means that I can do decode in one cycle, maybe two, depending upon what frequency you want. Uh, if you look at other cores, you're talking like seven cycles, even for just a two gigahertz processor to do decode and rename. Um, and the other thing that's interesting about this is pretty much all of their ISAs commit at least some of these sends in probably all of these sins, and RISC-5, uh, you know, it's pretty nice. I, I'm, I'm really a, a huge fan of RISC-5. Um, the rocket ship SOC generator, this is open source. At Berkeley, we've taped this out about 11 times now, I think. You guys keep doing it, so I can't remember how many times you've done it. Uh, they've demonstrated, I think, up to 1.6 gigahertz in IBM 45. Uh, from my point of view, this is a great library uh, component, uh, a great library of processor components, like page table walkers, uh, caches, uh, BTBs, all sorts of things that I can use that already exist. And the way that Boom works is that we're going to take a rocket tile and we're just going to swap out, uh, swap the rocket tile with the Boom tile. So I get all this other stuff for free. And uh, as rocket ship gets better, so does Boom. Uh, so um, I guess we were learning that they're going to add the debug stuff to rocket ship. And a lot of that Boom is just going to get for free once they do that work. Um, in terms of updates to rocket ship, uh, we have added uncached loads and stores. Uh, we're supporting memory mapped I.O. now uh, and replaced the MIMIO with Axie, so this is easier for other people to talk to. Uh, and the work in progress is to remove the host target interface, so this is a completely untethered system. Um, so this is what, uh, you know, some of the stuff that we've been working on. It, it's still changing. Uh, I use Chisel. This is our hardware construction language uh, embedded in Scala that we developed at Berkeley. Uh, it's not high-level synthesis, so you are still thinking in terms of registers and wires and memories, uh, but it's so much nicer to use than something like Verilog or HDL, BHDL. Uh, you get object-oriented programming, you get functional programming, and from one source you can get a software simulator in C, or you can get uh, a layout in ASIC, or you can put it to FPGA. Uh, and in terms of updates, we're working on version 3. From the programmer side, nothing's really going to change, maybe a few little things that are pretty easy. We have a compatibility mode in version 2. Uh, but the real thing is that we're rewriting the back end, so there's going to be an IR uh, called Fertile Flexible IR for uh, RTL, uh, so other people can maybe come in with their own front ends to chisel. Uh, so this is some pretty exciting work that we're doing. Uh, now we can talk about Boom. Um, the way Boom works is we have a fetch stage, fetches instructions, puts them in the fetch buffer. Uh, decode and rename can, can take place in parallel. Uh, once it's renamed the instructions, it pushes into an issue window. In the issue window, instructions, once their operands are ready, can request to be selected. And then they'll go to the physical register file to read their operands, execute, and then write back. Uh, so if you go into more detail, um, this is explicit renaming, like an R10K or an Alpha 21264 or Sandy Bridge machine. Um, uh, so the map tables do hold the, tell you where the, in the register file the uh, ISA register is. Um, the current way that this works is the floating point and the integer are in the same register file, and the map tables just tell you which is which. Um, and the unified, uh, the issue window holds all types of instructions, uh, memory instructions, floating point, and integer. Um, and that's something, you know, maybe we'll split up later, depending upon how wide of a design we want to go with. Um, Boom is parameterized, so here's an example of a two-wide um, design with uh, an FPU, ALU, and integer multiplier on one side, uh, divide and illustrator unit, ALU on the other side, and it turns out the way that this is represented in Chisel is just an array buffer of XE units, and then we just instantiate a module and say what's in the module. And if we want to go to a four-wide design, 
we just add another two lines of code and we get a four wide processor. So what this is doing in Chisel is it's auto-generating the bypass network, the register read ports, uh, the write back ports on the register file, the issue select logic. All of that comes with just adding the extra two lines of code. So this is pretty cool. Uh, Chisel is pretty powerful. Uh, I'm going to skip kind of through this, uh, but basically we, you know, describe function units as a hierarchy and allows me to steal other people's code and then I can wrap it up in these pipeline objects that handle all the branch speculation, the branch kills. There's a couple parameters you can choose in Boom uh, to fit what you need. Uh, some of these, like in ROB size, are just a, a simple parameter. Some of them really change a lot of code, like fetch decode commit widths. Uh, and, and in terms of describing things like the issue width, that's really invoking a whole generator framework. Uh, so there's a, quite a few things you can play around with. You can also play around with you know, the issue scheduler or how rollback goes on exceptions. Uh, it is synthesizable. We're targeting ASIC with this. So here's kind of a, a two-wide Boom uh, in TSMC 45. Um, but it also runs in the FPGA. Uh, we've been using a Zinc uh, ZC706 uh, for, our, uh, for our experiments. Uh, how fast can Boom be clocked? It depends on the parameters. You can, of course, pick some pretty terrible uh, parameters. But when I'm targeting like a Cortex-A9 size uh, for two wide, we're looking at about 1.5 gigahertz. And, and that's in part because the rocket ship that we've taped out is hitting 1.5, 1.6, depending upon the SRAM uh, cycle time that we're given. Uh, so Boom is designed for a single cycle SRAM access. Uh, although we are playing on a tape out uh, up, uh, upcoming in this year, so this is gonna keep us honest. I'll have to actually deliver 1.5 uh, gigahertz. And uh, my lab mates actually seem to kind of want to go faster, so we might actually have to readdress the single cycle SRAM access. Uh, so I'm interested in hearing you know, people's feedbacks on, on how their uh, things are connected and what they expect. Oh, and on the FPGA, we're looking at 50 megahertz on the ZC706, and the bottleneck is actually the FPGA tools uh, can't register retime the FPU. Um, you know, the ASIC tools understand the way that we describe our code. Um, uh, maybe we can figure that out. Maybe the tools just have to catch up with us, but 50 megahertz I'm actually pretty happy with. Uh, Boom has full branch uh, speculation support. We can have multiple instructions in flight with a single cycle kill. Uh, the gray area is actually from Rocket's front end, uh, so we're using a next line predictor with the BTB, BHT, return address stack, and that's combinational single cycle. And then we have a backing predictor that you can implement uh, an SRAM as a, a single port, and that's a global history uh, predictor. Uh, the load store unit is talking to Rocket's non-blocking data cache. That was actually designed for our vector unit, so it's, it's designed for a lot of bandwidth. Um, and the load store unit, loads are executing fully out of order with respect to stores and other loads. Um, that's based on our current understanding of the memory model. Uh, I'm happy to entertain ideas of maybe strengthening this. I know there's been some discussion on the mailing lists. Um, you know, if, if, if we at least order other loads, you know, it can just use the same uh, CAM port that the stores are using. Uh, so it's certainly amenable to, to stricter models. Uh, and it does forward uh, store data as required. Um, so it, it goes pretty high performance. Um, so in terms of the feature summary of Boom, it is parameterizable, it implements the full ISA. And uh, the cool thing is with Chisel and being able to use Rocket Ship, uh, Boom is actually only 9,000 lines of code. And another 11,000 lines is in Rocket Ship. So I'm hoping that by having a, a smaller line count that this makes it easier for other people to come in and, and understand what's been done and, and improve on it. That's what Boom is. What's the performance comparison to other processors? So here's a, a Cortex A9, which is kind of what I'm gunning for. Um, it's a 32-bit ARM processor, a little bit older, but it's still commercially sold. So our, you know, for example, our Zinc FPGAs come with these. You can buy these today. Uh, so ARM, this is a two-wide, uh, three plus one issue. So the floating point is actually in order on the ARM. Boom, it's fully out of order. Uh, in terms of performance, uh, we're getting about 9% more core marks. This is what ARM likes to brag about when they talk about their processor performance. Uh, so we are just a little bit better for the same, trying to match the same architectural parameters, the same ROB size. Um, and uh, we're quite a bit smaller, although it's, it's a bit of a hard comparison. Uh, this includes, uh, they have a, a Neon SIMD unit. Um, uh, although they don't have an FMA, they don't have AMOs, they are a 32-bit register file as opposed to my 64-bit register file. And also, the, the area changes a lot based on how much you want to clock the ARM core. It can fluctuate 30%. So this is just giving you a rough idea that this isn't completely off base. Uh, and we're targeting, again, the same frequency. Uh, and you know, trying to look at power here, uh, if we run uh, boom on core mark, uh, just one core uh, and 45 TSMC at 1 gigahertz, 1 volt, we're looking at about a quarter of a watt. Um, ARM, it's hard to find their power numbers, but it looks like they were reporting about anywhere from about half a watt to two watts running dry stone, uh, which is only going to be touching the cores. Uh, but basically, these are hard comparisons to make, but we're, you know, we're within the ballpark. 
Um, now that's just, you know, core mark. We really want to be talking about something like spec. This is what people really want to see. Um, so I want to talk about, you know, my experiences working with spec. Uh, first of all, it's 12 benchmarks, 35 workloads, averaging 2 trillion instructions per benchmark. So that's 24 trillion instructions total. If you want to benchmark your laptop, it'll take you two hours. And if you want to use a simulator, uh, like uh, Gym 5 or, or whatever, um, if you can get it at 100 kips, it's going to take you seven years. Uh, so that's a problem. That'll take a little, you know, even longer than a PhD thesis. Um, but if we use an FPGA cluster, we can actually bring this down uh, quite a bit. I'll show on the next slide. Um, now, with RISC-V, uh, in my experience, this requires uh, the glibc version. Um, new lib almost compiles spec, but a few things are a little bit off. Um, you know, mem.h, string.h. Uh, and uh, you have to kind of run this on Linux. Our proxy kernel um, gets too stressed out with all the virtual memory stuff going on. So uh, in my experience, I'm running spec on Linux using glibc. And um, spec it, it assumes that the uh, design under test is the same one that built spec. And in reality, with simulators, you actually want to be able to use portable spec directories. So I have a, a, an open source um, uh, thing, a repository on GitHub that helps you know, people. Uh, it helps you if you have spec. Uh, it'll build you a portable directory. So this is what I use for putting spec on an FPGA to run my results. Um, so I'll show you just uh, some preliminary data. This is running just one workload of GCC on a two-wide boom with an L2. So I'm showing you uh, performance on the top, branch prediction accuracy, and cache misses. And the green line is the cumulative average of those things, and the blue line is instantaneous. So I actually have running uh, on a little side channel, I'm, you know, a little program that will wake up, print out the microarch counters, and then go to sleep. So each dot is 100 million uh, cycles uh, between that. Uh, so that's a lot of data that's on this graph, and it only takes an hour to get, you know, about 200 billion cycles. Uh, so this is pretty cool. It shows me that there's a lot of in interesting stuff going on in spec, at least with the GCC benchmark. Uh, there's a lot more branch accuracy improvements that I have to make. Um, and maybe I should be looking at, like, prefetchers to help with the, the cache misses. Uh, but this is data that we can get with Boom uh, today, which is really, really cool. Uh, in terms of the spec score, this is still a to-do. Um, the only problem here, actually, is the uh, FPGA tooling is I need more DRAM uh, to be able to talk to more, more stuff. So this is uh, pretty easy to fix, just wasn't able to do in time for this. And even if you are able to talk to uh, enough DRAM, you still actually have to emulate the true latencies of the DRAM. Uh, so that way I'm not giving you a misleading spec score. So uh, this is, you know, eminently doable. Hopefully we'll have this for the next retreat. Uh, and the cool thing is that we do have an FPGA cluster, and so you're, you're limited by the longest running workload, and so it actually only take you about a day uh, to get a spec score of boom once we uh, get the FPGA infrastructure uh, sorted out. Uh, so this is really pretty cool stuff we can do. All right, so how do you guys use boom? Uh, there's two repositories uh, that are important here. One is boom uh, at the following URL, and that's just the source code for the processor. Um, you actually uh, will clone the rocket ship repository, which is what's required. It provides the rest of the SOC uh, infrastructure. And uh, there's some tutorials as well as how to use rocket ship. Um, and in order to quick start boom, you just download rocket, you check out uh, the boom branch of rocket ship, and then you just call make run with uh, the boom configuration. So the config flag sets exactly what configuration of boom or you know, rocket or zscale or whatever that you want to build. Uh, so boom is currently a branch. Uh, make run will, will run some smoke tests, and there's a whole bunch of different configurations uh, to play with. Now, how do I verify and debug Boom? Parameterization makes this tough. Uh, MIT was talking about this uh, earlier. Um, the way that I do this is I'm really only uh, verifying a single design point. Uh, I'm running RISC-V test as kind of the smoke test. I also make sure CoreMark runs with the proxy kernel. I make sure that it boots Linux, it runs spec. And my favorite is torture. Um, so now, I uh, figured if we're open sourcing Boom, we should probably also open source Torture to help you debug Boom. Um, the way that Torture works is it will generate a random uh, uh, test sequence, uh, and then you run that on your processor, and you run that on Spike. And at the end of the program, it'll dump out the register state to memory. You diff that state. And if there's an error found, it'll actually rerun the test with the smaller program to find pretty close to the error what the offending instruction was. Um, so Torture is a great way to find not only that there's bugs in your processor, but also help you um, get very close to solving uh, how the bug got there. Um, and this is an uh, instruction on how to run uh, torture. <coughs> uh, the other thing I use to help uh, along with torture is I do have a way of spinning out a commit log uh, from Boom. 
Um, so you can spit out the privilege level, the PC, the instruction, the write back address, the write back data. Uh, and, you know, this is a little bit, unfortunately, it's still kind of semi-automated. Uh, semi um, uh, interested in seeing what other people have done with Spike to, uh, to make this more of a tethered uh, system. Um, the base Spike, uh, there are some things like spinning on a load reserve store condition that can va be valid differences that you have to deal with. Uh, so it's still, right now, a little bit uh, automated, but it's something that we'd like to uh, improve and, and make uh, Verify and Boom a lot easier. Um, in terms of documentation, I will have a design doc at this following URL uh, in the next week or two. Uh, I do want to make this uh, much more easy to understand and play with. Um, I'm interested in getting your feedback on exactly how you guys like to process documentation or how you like to have uh, communication uh, to make this more of a collaborative effort. Uh, in terms of my future plans, uh, looking to do a tape out this year. Uh, I will be adding uncached loads and stores so that way I can move up to the current master of rocket ship. Uh, update to Chisel 3 uh, when that drops. And uh, I'm looking to actually be able to give a spec score and uh, improve branch prediction accuracy, memory ordering speculation. Um, uh, so that way, it'll be something that's, you know, very competitive with uh, some of the ARM Cortex cores. Uh, the finished documentation, so that way you guys can understand this. And uh, interested in building a community of, I don't know, maybe baby boomers will be our name. Um, but I, this is something that I do want to be, uh, you know, not just something that I drop over the wall, but something that is a, a community effort. Uh, and with that, um, Boom is an RB64 GU processor. Uh, it's 10,000 lines of code and four person years of work. Uh, I think it's a good pr uh, platform for prototyping, and uh, it's now open source. Um, so uh, now I yield to questions. You mentioned Chisel 3.0 a couple of times. Any idea on the time frame when that's going to be released? Uh, I, in terms of the Chisel 3 timeline, I'm not a Chisel dev, so that is not something that I'm at liberty to say. Um, I think uh, the point of contact to talk to would probably be Jonathan uh, Backrack. Thanks. But I'm, I'm anticipating soon, but I wait eagerly too. Here's Jonathan here. Oh, okay. I great. put Jonathan on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get a beta alpha release uh, end of uh, this month or next month, and uh, we, but we got um, Rocket Chip a uh, good chunk of it running. We're just trying to do. Uh, a mock tape out with it, and uh, but everything's up and running, so we're hoping that it'll be very soon. Um, so we'll be announcing it shortly. Anyone want to follow that? Be on the Chisel users mailing list on Google. Okay, thanks. Hey, on one of your slides, you had a hundred thousand instructions per second in simulation. Was that with the Chisel C++, or was that just a number out of the air? Uh, are you talking about the 100 kips that I was reporting? Yeah, that that's seems... not using Boom. That's using a software simulator. That's when I was looking at uh, some of the uh, like Simple Scalar, Gem5, uh, Sask. Those are the numbers that I was seeing were reported for other software simulators that are used in architecture research. Uh, for the speed of Boom in C++ simulation, yeah. I'm sure it's quite a lot slower. I can't remember yeah. off the top of my head uh, because it's quite a lot more going on. Um, I think it's something like 15 kips, but I don't. I'm, I'm like I can't swear to that. Okay, um, but you know, when I'm doing testing and verification, I'll, I'll do C++ simulation and uh, VCS simulation. And then when I actually want to run something like uh, much longer, I'll, I'll pull out the FPGA. OK, thank you. 15 kilo, uh, instructions a second is still pretty impressive. So congratulations. I, that's thanks to the chisel people. Don't thank me. I, I add more code, and it makes it slower and slower. So they do a good job of optimizing chisel. Hi. Uh, you had a chart comparing with ARM v7, I think. Do you have? one with, uh, did you compare with V8? Um, in terms of comparing against V8, uh, let me see if I have that. Uh, in terms of comparing to V8, uh, my comparisons are cores that I could get my hands on. Um, so we had a, an ARM Cortex A9 board that I think was donated by NVIDIA. And I had a, a Chromebook that I was able to get with an A15 core. Um, if people would like to donate to me uh, A50 series or A70 series cores, I'd be very happy to report those numbers. Do you have an idea on comparing your out-of-order machine against the in-orders you have in your rocket? Uh, comparisons to rocket? Yes. Um, Some idea? Uh, yeah, I do have, let me see if I have that slide. I do have, I think, a slide just using Cormark as a comparison. Um, let me see. Yeah, so here, here's a slide comparing Cormarks. This is per megahertz to try and to uh, 
um, normalized to the architecture. Obviously, for Ivy Bridge, their megahertz is like three or four. Uh, the Cortex A15 is a two, two gigahertz. But for the, all the other ones behind Boom 4, all the way down, these are all about 1.5 gigahertz processors. So in terms of uh, core marks per megahertz, uh, it's quite a bit better than Rocket. Uh, the nice thing about core mark is it's only testing the pipeline. It's a little unfair to Rocket because you start running programs with memory. Um, you know, depending upon how, how the program is, Rocket can look better or worse. Um, because Boom can dynamically schedule around that. Um, so what, what is the frequency comparison between Boom and Rocket? This is uh, scaled for, to megahertz. Yeah, for, for a Boom 2 wide, it's, it's the same frequency as Rocket. Uh, I've made sure that my critical paths are better than the SRAM access. Uh, for Boom 4 wide, I've not really spent time hitting the critical paths there. So uh, in my experience, that gets up to about 1-ish gigahertz, a little north of 1. Uh, so in that case, if you went 4 wide, you'd be slower than Rocket. But that's just without spending any time to, to hit on that critical path. Uh, just curious, have you played with combining this with run ahead or any of the semi out of order execution models as well? Uh, no, I've not. Uh, I've just been focusing on bringing up a prototypical out of order machine. Uh, I don't have any results to, to compare on, on other interesting ideas. Is there like a roadmap of fun things you plan to try? Um, I have a lot of ideas I want to do. It's not so much a map as a cluster of just ideas, and it depends on what my advisors will let me do, and it depends on what you know, some of the other students in the lab are interested in, in, in doing themselves. So, You had a slide with IPC numbers for one of the benchmarks. Uh, for Cormark, I do. Let's see. Here's a IPC of Cormark. Um, no, you had another one. I think it was like 0.9, then 1, then... Oh, oh, oh the uh, yeah, spec results. Yeah, this is, um, like I said, very preliminary data, so I wouldn't look at the absolute numbers too well. Um, part of the problem is that when you're running spec, a lot, you know, this is testing the whole processor and the whole I.O. and everything. Is this a three instruction issue processor? This is a two wide with, I believe, three uh, issue. Three instruction issue? I think, it's, I think the way that this was set up was maybe two LUs, uh, a floating point, and a load store unit. Um, so I think you could do like two LUs and a load. I'm not sure if you could do three LUs together. So does this number change if you program your core to be four instruction issue, for example? If you increase the instruction issuing, do you see improvement in that? Uh, yeah, I, could sh I have some data I could show you offline that uh, graphs multiple cores uh, on top of each other. And there are changes. Uh, it's, it's very cool data. One more question. Is your ROB, is it programmable, the depth? Uh, yeah, you can program the, uh, the size of it. Um, Do you know what's the size Do you set in your code? Um, I think this is about 50 ROB entries. Um, I don't remember what I set it to. The, the ROB is very cheap, the way that it's programmed. Uh, it's really the issue window is the uh, one that's much harder and more expensive to increase. 